Belgian borders. And um, obviously, this is the 100th anniversary of the partition of Ireland. And so borders are very alive politically. And were we not in pandemic times, it would be interesting to figure out what the kind of headlines about partition and about Brexit, what would they be like for us at the moment? And so what we thought we'd want to do um, for this final event is to have a conversation about borders with two experts who've been spending um, years of their lives reflecting on various aspects of the question of borders in different parts of the world. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Katie Hayward, who is the Professor of po Political Sociology at Queen's University Belfast and a senior fellow um, for the ESRC funded UK in a Changing Europe initiative. Um, she works full time on the topic of Brexit and Northern Ireland, the Irish border. She's an Eisenhower Fellow and she is a member of the Centre for International Borders Research. And she's on the steering group of the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's, the author of over 300 publications. She um, was a lead author on the report, Anticipating and Meeting New Multi-Level Governance Challenges for Northern Ireland After Brexit, which I'm sure was a great and um, <laughs> very enjoyable project. I wonder if you came up with an acronym for that particular project. She's been awarded the Ewart Biggs Memorial Prize and the title of Political Communicator of the Year from the Political Studies Association um, in the UK. And she was also appointed to, as a technical expert to the UK government's Alternative Arrangements Advisory Group on Brexit. So we have in the, the privilege of having um, Katie with us tonight, somebody who has spent so much energy and time and research and with profound levels of communication speaking about um, borders. And then um, Dong Jin Kim is uh, the Irish School of Ecumenics Fellow in Peace and Reconciliation Studies based in Dublin uh, with Trinity College Dublin there, but doing a lot of back and forth between Dublin and Belfast. He got his PhD from the University of North Korean Studies in Korea, in Seoul in Korea, and his academic background also includes peace and conflict studies and theology. And he is the Goodwill Ambassador for Peace on the Korean Peninsula, um, appointed by the Ministry of Unification of the Republic of Korea. And he's been working as a policy advisor for a number of Korean peace building NGOs also. He's the author of the book, The Korean Peace Process and Civil Society, which was published by Palgrave. And he's the co-editor too of a forthcoming book with David Mitchell called Reconciling Divided States, Peace Processes in Ireland and Korea. And so we have two people here tonight who are going to be able to give us all kinds of e extraordinary insights into how they see borders and how borders can be in communication with each other. So as we start, I would be delighted, and um, Katie, we'll start with you, if you'd be able to introduce yourself really uh, by telling us um, why the borders that you work with and around are of such interest to you. Thank you very much, Podrick, and hello, everybody. It's a great privilege to be here. And um, I feel a little bit overwhelmed by your introduction <laughs> because um, I'm very conscious of the fact that I am a political sociologist um, and a slightly wonky one at that, um, and definitely not a theologian, but I really appreciate the opportunity to come and have this conversation with Jin and with yourself and um, to talk about what is a really, um, an ever-growing sort of um, subject of interest and indeed of uh, continued importance. So um, I think, so there's two ways in which um, borders interest me. Firstly, sort of academically and intellectually, they're a subject of great fascination and also emotionally as well. Um, just to touch on the first, I mean, there's an irony around borders in that the subject is boundless. And if you look at border studies, although we tend to get in a rut sometimes, um, in many ways, it is a boundless kind of field of interest. Um, so it's an interesting way of understanding society, the way this power works, the way that um, uh, people organize themselves and conceive of themselves. It's a way of understanding history, of course, a way of understanding culture, it's a way of looking at administration, the role of economics and finance, etc. Um, and indeed, uh, it is also a, a multi-level subject. So oftentimes I started, um, you know, my, my PhD involved looking at the way that the Irish border had been transformed through European integration. Um, that was in the early 2000s. And then by the time, you know, 10 years later, looking at this subject still, 
I was much more concentrating on borders as they work between people and between communities, like the local demonstration of borders. Um, and of course, they work at the highest level as well, international organizations. So that's why it's kind of inter intellectually quite interesting because it's boundless and ever growing. Also, most particularly, of course, my work's focused on the Irish border. And again, it's intellectually fascinating because of the paradox there. So, you know, the, the, the significance of its insignificance um, is, is something that really interests me because it's very difficult to explain except for living it. And um, so I've done, I did quite a bit of work in the last few years in the Irish central border region. And oftentimes people would say, well, you know, the Irish border isn't important at all. It doesn't affect me at all. And yet at the same time, it became very clear, it's all important. It defines almost everything or a lot that seems significant to people, uh, not just politically, but also in their daily lives. Um, and it's that kind of, uh, the way that the border affects experience and perception that's really fascinating. And then related to that is of course, the emotional dy dynamics of borders and why, why, why they affect us emotionally in such a way and um, I studied at McGee, uh, Peace and Conflict Studies, and um, I did a gap year in Derry beforehand. And just even, you know, one of my strongest memories from Derry is just what it felt like to go across the border to Greenland, for example, or up to Coldaf. And, you know, why was it that you had that kind of emotional response to crossing the border? And it's not just the beauty of Donegal, but, it, but there's something about that, and even going down to Dublin, et cetera. Um, and that too is an interesting dimension of borders that I don't want to lose sight of. And then finally, just to sort of bring it to a close, uh, one other thing that's really interesting about borders is their, their constant evolution. And of course, in the case of the Irish border, you know, in 2013, 14, 15, um, the Irish border was upheld as a model of, um, obviously of, of work in reconciliation, of integration, and a lot of the stuff I was doing in border studies was about taking examples from Ireland and, and, and using them elsewhere and um, upholding the Irish case as a model for cooperation. And then four years later, I find myself on the, with the Eisenhower Fellowship on the US-Canada border and on the US-Mexico border, trying to get examples of the way that technology can be used to facilitate movement across the border uh, because we will, you know, because it seemed like it might be used across the Irish border. Um, and that was a very strange situation to be in, to be conceptualizing, thinking of the Irish border whilst, you know, <laughs> uh, looking at um, very hard borders um, and thinking what might possibly be and, and then that emotional dimension to it as well as the intellectual. Yeah. Now, of course, I've just completed a book on the Irish border and I was thinking as much about the sea border as I was about the land border. So it's an ever growing topic and I'll never be bored, I think. I'm struck that the Irish word for border is children, which means um, limitation. And mm -hmm. there's all kinds of ways within which borders reveal various political, imaginative, societal, personal, and emotional limitations and invitations to, I think, hopefully. So, Jin, I'd love to hear you respond to the same question. I wonder if you could introduce yourself and let us know um, why it is that the question of borders is of such interest to you. You've given so many years of your life to this question. Thank you very much, Patrick, and for your kind introduction and very generous introduction. I really am looking forward to having a conversation with you and Katie, and I'm really privileged and honored <laughs> to be here as a Korean, and, um, but I'm also um, sort of really privileged to be part of uh, the Korean Milad community. So one thing missing from your introduction is that I'm a member, proud member of Korean Milad. And so um, my interest um, in border, I, I think I could borrow um, Katie's framework of emotion and an academic interest perhaps, that emotionally I am, um, quite close to the issue of border because uh, my ancestors, my grandparents were all from North Korea, even though I grew up in South Korea. So they were IDPs, uh, internally displaced people during the Korean War. But then growing up 
you know, as a South Korean, I was quite careless about North Korea and then the issue about border as a child. And you hear a lot about North Korea and from the news. And then I was taught to believe that the reunification should be the ultimate goal for, for us as a Korean. And then there is a song about it. And then you, you just have to sort of memorize the clouds and you have to say it every day <laughs> in the school, etc. But then it really didn't, it, it wasn't really part of my life until I became a military chaplain in the Korean army and I served a, a, as a chaplain in the army. And my main duty was um, obviously providing religious service, but at the same time, uh, counseling and civilian military relations as such. And then it was my first time actually, I really encountered the reality of the border so-called demilitarized zone, which is an oxymoron because it's highly militarized border. And, and, and then for, for, re, for many reasons, these young people, it's not their intention to be there, but it was, it's a mandatory service for them to be there for Korean at that time, two, two years and sometimes three years. For North Koreans, nearly 10 years, these young people are being trained as a potential killing machines and spending their, their life just there, spending in the military barrack for three years, right? And then because of the anxieties and then the difference between their civilian life and the military lives, I mean, it, it has been causing lots of issues in the South Korean societies about militarized you know, masculinities and then the you know, company culture and etc. And in the in in the in the military selves, and they couldn't really cope the different realities. And sometimes they they are depressed, and then they have lots of issues. And and then one day, I got a call from the unit, and I I, I was asked to to report back. And then uh, I learned that uh, one of the soldiers. Uh, were really upset about something and he shot uh, two of his colleagues and one uh, was dead immediately and the other one had to amputate one's arm and, and the soldier fled with the rifle and next day he, he attempted suicide but only paralyzing oneself. And, and then series of similar incidents like suicide and all sometimes hidden from the civilian life and captain secrets as such, but then just looking at it, you know, really from the vicinity of this life and near the border, and it really changed my life and I had to do something about it. And then by that point that I was trained as a theologian and then a, a pastor, but then, you know, I was asking myself, what, what could those training do for me? Like, you know, I was yearning for, prophetic imagination. And, and then my knowledge was, wasn't really about North Korea or border or Korean Peninsula. It was more to do with Roman Empire and history of the early Christianity 2000 years ago. And then I was challenged by, uh, by these young um, military um, soldiers that what do you know about our reality? Why do you think that we, we are here? And it was like, theologically, it was my Zichin Laban moment. Like, you know, what, 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 what should I do? How could I interpret this in my own context? So I had to learn about North Korea. I had to learn about border. I had to learn about um, other borders. I and mean, then I had to, I mean, develop my sociological imagination I and mean, prior to my prophetic imagination to learn really about my context and, and then ended up uh, visiting Ireland to learn other contexts and staying more than six years now. So that's my border experience. And then it's, it's great to hear about the border between Donegal and Derry because that's where um, pre-COVID I, I would bring my, my Korean colleagues to, uh, to show um, how open border would look like, like Koshpin area and then so the sort of pre-peace process and what it was like this, you know, uh, the unfortunate uh, tragic incidents about, you know, the car bomb and, and all, all that now it's a pop and this sort of the past 
present and then would really bring some imagination for for the Koreans whether that would be possible for Korea and then I would bring some people from Ireland to Korea to visit the demilitarization and it would be a moment for, for people to look at the size and then also the similarity in terms of the military checkpoint and then when, if you have a memory of, of those soldiers and those are the things that at the moment I am doing intellectually and then with for my academic work and, and for my practice. Thank you for having me here. Well, thank you. Um, we've we've a lot we've a lot that we could talk about, but I'd like to touch into a few topics, and then what we'll do is we'll invite some questions, which I'm sure will bring us deeper into the, some of the topics you've you've already described. So it is just a call to folks to make sure to put some questions into the Q and A, or to put some questions into the chat. And some of my Coromila colleagues are going to be monitoring that and picking up those questions and feeding them to me in a while. But like Jin, your um. You're, you're an ambassador really um, sponsored or at least affiliated with the Korean Ministry for Unification. And when I heard that there was such a thing, I was like, my God, that's extraordinary. What a title. And then Katie, I know you released, you were part of a huge research project. Was it in 2020 or maybe it was released in 2021? Looking at here is what the possibility of um, here is what the possibility of um, a border poll around um, Ireland and the North, um, the, Re the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland. Here's what a border poll would look like. There's a lot of emotion around the question of, um, of reunification or not. Do you even call it that? What is it? Do some people want it? Do some people resist it? Um, uh, yeah. I should just say I'm, I've gotten about five messages in the last two seconds about telling me to turn my volume up. It is up full um, volume, so um, I'm trying my best. I might try to make um, a small modification if I can, but it is up full volume at the moment. So, so but Katie and Jin, I, I wonder if both of you could respond to the idea of talking about some of the emotion that's present, because emotion is a political um, currency around questions of reunification or border polls. Do you want to start first, Katie? Yes, so it's a good question, Padraig, but I, I try not to think of these things in emotional terms, although I will say, and maybe that sounds very pompous, but I, I, I will say that the experience of being on this working group on Irish, on referendums, Hang on, I have to get the title right. It was a very complicated title for the project. Um, uh, right. Referendums on unification on the island of Ireland. You see what I mean? We're good with, you know, uh, with wordy titles in academia. So basically, this working group was, it's still going. We just published the interim report. We're about to pu publish the final report. And um, it was literally looking at the mechanics of a, of a referendum on Irish unity. And uh, I was, the sociologists in the group, but there are political scientists, there are plenty of lawyers, as needs be, and experts on referendums. And the interesting thing is, apart from, apart from the content, etc., just quite how difficult it was for us as a, as a fairly small group, um, coming at this from our particular expertise, um, to come to agreement on, on a number of issues. Um, and this is possibly where the emotional thing comes in, but partly we were trying to say, let's take the Good Friday Belfast Agreement as the foundation um, for um, the fact that it's possible to have a referendum on Irish unity. We know that if there is to be Irish unification, that it would come on the back of a referendum in Northern Ireland. Um, and then to ask the, the essential questions, basically, if you take this as your foundation, what what does the process look like? Um, it's an enormous report, interim report. The, the final report will be even bigger. Um, and I see there, I, I looked it up the other day and um, you know, and it says anticipated reading time and it's over seven hours for the, <laughs> for the thing. And you can imagine the hours and hours of deliberation over even like sentences, let alone paragraphs. Um, and so I, I think, so a fundamental thing is, you know, we often talk about having conversations and dialogues around Irish unity, but this was, um, it was difficult. 
And this is just us coming from, there are people from the south, from the north, and from um, England. Um, and this is just mainly us coming from our disciplinary backgrounds. Um, but you sort of realize there are so many questions that are unanswered. So that are raised by what's possible through the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, we assume oftentimes that because there's provision for a referendum that it's clearer than the case for Scotland, for example. Um, but there are many questions, you know, how would, on what grounds would the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland make the judgment that uh, there is likely to be a majority voting for unification if there was such a referendum? Um, what role is there for the Irish government in this? I mean, in the Good Friday Agreement itself, it's, you know, for the people of the island of Ireland alone by agreement between the two parts respectively, without external impediment, etc. But it's the Secretary of State as the British government ministry who makes that judgment call. I say, on what grounds does he do that? And where does the Irish government fit into this? You know, how are they going to be consulted given that on, on balance, we, we decided that um, a referendum would be needed in the South, you know, freely and concurrently given, although it's not spelled out. Um, and obviously, how, how would that, that referendum be framed? Um, we made the decision or the judgment that it's basically between Northern Ireland remaining in the UK or a United Ireland, it's that straight cut. Um, but beyond that, there's questions around franchise, questions around campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think um, it's been a, it was, it's led by Alan Rennick in, in University College London. It's been a, <laughs> I often said to him, you know, you must regret ever conceiving of this as stuff, but it's, it's been a it's, a, it's a good learning process, but it's most definitely just the beginning. Um, and just in terms, just in, even in terms of mechanics, just realizing quite how many unanswered questions there are. So, I mean, what you're doing so helpfully is problematizing even the idea of a, what, what could seem like a simple question, like what are the emotions around a, around a border poll about reunification um, to say, well, actually it's, it's, it's not even that simple to answer that question. Mm -hmm. How about in Korea, Jin? I know, like there is this ministry for <laughs> unity, which which shocked me, um, and I'm I'm fascinated by by that being a formal part of government. Is that a, an accepted or a contested um, aim from some people? Uh, and is it is it widely held across South Korea? Um, thank you for uh, the question, Poetry. Uh, before I answer the question, I should just make it clear that I'm, what I'm trying to say here is not, I mean, not necessarily I see the parallel between the Irish and Northern Irish peace process and the Korean peace process. I, I see the differences, the obvious differences, like the nature of the petitions, definitely different. One is more or less about perhaps ethnicity and religion, the identity issues would be different from the ideological issues at a glance. And, and then, but then it, at the end of the day, I mean, from my point of view that it's, it's about incompatibility in terms of the political goal to have one's own nation state. Uh, but then in terms of Korea, uh, the rhetoric about reunification and then now people generally sort of would like to call it unification. So I, I noticed that Katie called it unification and then Project you described it reunification. I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but then in Korea, the reunification is to highlight the fact that we were together before and then now we are, we really want to be reunited. So for example, like, you know, family reunion. So the separated and estranged family because of the border and then at the moment, about 30,000 um, sort of families are still, you know, separated. And then because of the advancing age of the people who are passing, that this has been a serious issues. And then when there was a peace process and then those people could meet for three days, but then only 100 families would be selected. So it was like a lottery. And it was a really tragic and sort of at the, at the same time moving thing, even for those 100 families were selected three days union, total separation again. So how could we really scare those issues? And then for them, definitely the unification is the issue of reunification, that we would want to go back to where we were together. 
but then increasingly in Korea, there were emerging identities and then ideas about sort of the present times and differences and about the future. And then they want to call it unification instead of reunification because they thought that it would be future oriented and then sort of embrace the term, not that reunification has something wrong about it, but then they would want to emphasize on the aspects of, of the present and future instead of the past. But then for, for the people who still believe that reunification is to highlight the unjust nature of the border and for them reunification was the thing. And then the ministry have decided to call themselves the ministry of unification and at the moment, and then which is still quite, I mean, it's interesting to hear from and from Podrig about that it's a shocking thing in terms of the ministry and it's a contested thing. But then for me, it was a shocking thing to, to see that you know, DFA, the foreign affairs is dealing with the, the <laughs> Northern Irish issues because it, apparently it's a foreign thing. And then I was like, when I first realized that I couldn't really, I mean, it was really strange for me that, you know, because at one point that in Korea, there was also an initiative to abolish the Ministry of Unification and then move all the functions to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then it was like, um, what, um, more than 10 years ago, there, there was an initiative and then there was huge opposition about that. And then we have Ministry of Unification in South Korea and then in North Korea, they call it United Front as, as a good socialist country would do this. <laughs> <laughs> United Front. And then the United Front is a party organization. On the other hand, for us, Ministry of Unification is the ministry. And then now I'm looking at the shared island unit, which is under the Taoiseach's office. So I, for me, it's I, I really try to turn off my Korean engines looking at the Irish situation. But sometimes it's just I, I cannot turn off this sort of sort of my comparison, my engines. But I'll, I'll just shut up with just one more thing. Then, but then one of the things that I see uh, also is that this political peace process, which we try to sort of institutionalize at some, some point, I mean, which is a great lesson for Korea, which has been like John Jun's ideas about people first rather than territory. And it's really quite something for Korea, meaning, I mean, the South Korean constitution still claims the whole entire Korean peninsula under their rule, even though the, according to the United Nations, they are two separate member states, but the South Korean constitution is in conflict with the UN sort of uh, memberships. Uh, and, and then still, you know, um, uh, how could we really then build a uh, human relationship across the border while you know, we have this incompatible political order and structures imposed upon us. And then the recently COVID-19 has been really, I mean, I know that it has been he here as well, but then has been highlighting this sort of, um, sort of uh, irony and paradox in Korea all the more because now the North Korean government had to shut down its border. And then uh, because of COVID-19, not only the North and South Korean border, but also the border with China. Yeah. And then what's happening here is that because of the, I mean, the Trump administration's, the, the former US president's uh, initiatives calling uh, maximum pressure while he's having a, you know, uh, some people jokingly call it a love affair with Kim Jong-un. And then the actual reality was the in international sanctions has been increasing, uh, you know, um, pressure on North Korea, closing down the borders. Now, North Korea has a diplomatic relationship with more than 150 countries in the world. It's not a hermit kingdom, but then it, because of the international sanctions, not a single bank would want to deal with North Korea, not even the humanitarian missions, the work that we would do. So the international organizations like UN would bring cash with their hands through Chinese borders down to the office in North Korea. They have, they had, I have to be careful, they had UNDP, World Food Program, um, uh, WHO, UNICEF, all these organizations they have concern worldwide in, in the country and then used to have Save the Children, all these international organizations and IFRC, International Fed, 
a federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent community all um, were there and then relying on those cash, you know, uh, deliveries through the Chinese borders and now the border is shut. So as of this month, um, all the international uh, UN workers left because they couldn't really depend on the government supply. So that's really showing the one hand that, you know, that we would want to build relationship, we would want to respect human rights and it's according to the charter. But at the same time, the, the international security element, you know, all these other dimensions about the complexity is really, it's not North Korea, it's really the international communities and us, you know, I shutting mean, the, the, the relationship. What both of you were doing so helpfully is showing how complex even ideas, even the words, reunification, unity, unifying, etc. Would I mean I'm I'm keen for the two of you to have um kind of back and forth with each other. So feel very free to do that at any point, as well as folks, if you want to put questions into the chat, um Emily and Sarah will pick some of those up and feed them to me. But I, I'm curious to to hear from both of you what the um contribution is if any, if there has been any unique contribution of theology or religious bodies um, that you see um, currently available, or do you think that religious bodies are like sporting bodies or anybody else that they can't do anything un until politics changes? Um, and, and not towards re unification, reunification, but more towards cross-border cooperation and uh, what I suppose here we'd call British-Irish cooperation and then Korea, you know, North-South um, cooperation. Where do you see the history of the churches in that? Have they done interesting things? Have they been prevented from doing interesting things, et cetera? Jin, will we start with you and then we'll come to Katie. Um, thank you very much for, for, for a very important question. Um, in terms of the role of the religion in Korea, I mean, because of the aspects of nuclear weapons and you know these missiles and, and it's, it's quite not, have been visible, but then there has been religious aspects in this. Uh, for example, Christianity, uh, the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, was once called Jerusalem of East Asia. Christianity was flourishing, and then mostly through the Chinese borders, many missionaries went to North Korea first, and then Christianity was flourishing in the North with this egalitarian ideas and, and different ideas, particularly under the Japanese colonial rule. It contributed to the independent movement in, in, in North Korea and South Korea. Uh, but then when the Korea was divided and then when the communist rule uh, uh, was um, sort of dominating uh, the agenda in the North, many Christians felt that they were being under persecution and, and mostly they couldn't really scare uh, with the communist rule or particularly the conscription of the lands and etc. And so they fled from the north to the south. And then during the war time, many people fled, including my grandparents, who were all Christians. And then they tend to have this strong anti-communist, anti-North Korea sentiment. Uh, so I mean, not only the liberal progressive Christians, but also I mean, I mean, not only the evangelical conservatives, but also progressive those Christians. So Christians were equivalent of the anti-communism in South Korea. But then so they were interested in addressing the issue of South Korea, which at the time under the military dictatorship, and then the military dictatorship in South Korea justified this dictatorship using the border between North and South Korea, which is highly volatile border. So they, in the name of protecting South Korea, the military rule, so the South Korean church groups, they really wanted to address that issue first and then realized that, you know, they couldn't really uh, move farther because the existing border and then existing division and ex existing conflict wouldn't allow them to really go further and raise the issue of democracy and human rights. So, and then at that time, the, in terms of World Council of Churches and Ecumenical Movement, we're highlighting the issue of uh, justice and participatory and sustainable, uh, sustainable society from Nairobi Assembly and to the Vancouver Assembly, the famous JPIC, Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation. And then influenced by that, and then from Latin America, liberation theology, and from the state's civil rights movement, 
And then in South Korea, um, we call it Minjung theology, uh, which is a theology um, initiated by the theologians who were educated from the Western um, sort of uh, universities about the new sociological interpretation of Bible. And then they, they carried this new biblical hermeneutics skills uh, back to Korea and then they were teaching, but then there were students who were working on UIM and URM, the urban mission, uh, urban industrial mission in, in Korea. And, and then asked the professor to come to the real world, I mean, of the reality. And then it really reshaped the, the, the understanding of these theologians, uh, Western Orient, you know, educated theologians developing these Minjung theologies. So they try to address this issue of the context together uh, in a way that this is a political division but then it cannot be really reconciled politically. It should be reconciled by people. So the, if it's, I mean, the issue itself cannot be reconciled, but then if there is a people's reconciliation, that is the justice. So because the, this division is, is, is not just about the division between North and South Korea, this is the division between those who are benefiting from the book, from the uh, militarized border those are suffering from the military borders. So how could we really reconcile those peoples? And then, you know, they, their idea was stop the manipulation. So they've asked the WCC uh, to, meet, to have a place for the North and South Korean churches to meet together. So that was in the eighties. And then coming back from that meeting, I just want to stop uh, by reading this paragraph, if I may which was announced by the South Korean church in uh, yeah, yeah. 1988 by National Council of Churches. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. And then, so this was issued by South Korea. And I don't know whether it would be relevant here or not, but then maybe it could, it would be helpful. So it's South Korean church saying, we confess that the Christians of the South especially have sinned by turning the anti-communist ideology into a virtual religious idol and have thus not been content to treat just the communist regime in the North as the enemy, but have further damned our Northern compatriots and others whose ideologies differ from our own. This is not only a violation of the commandment, but is also a scene of indifference toward our neighbors who have suffered and continue to suffer under the national division. It is moreover a scene of failure to ameliorate they're suffering through the love of Christ. Wow. So stop here. It's a serious. Um, yeah. And I know that with that statement that was being issued, that it was, I mean, it's a powerful statement, but yet it was voted down and it wasn't adopted by the National Council. No, Kate, that's true. Where do you see the role of churches in doing, I mean, not necessarily anything to do with um, a border pole, but particularly to do with um, kind of British-Irish relations on the island of Ireland, between the island of Ireland and Britain, kind of north-south and east-west relations. Do you see that religion has had a, has a role um, previously or today? Um, yes, uh, I mean, this isn't my area of expertise by any, any um, stretch of the imagination, and I'm very conscious that Cory Miller of, of all organizations understands and practices um, cross-border cooperation in a very meaningful and significant way, even looking at the international representation uh, of those present in our discussion today, that sort of that shows that very well. I mean, there's a few, there's a few points that that are of interest, I think. And so one thing I'm very conscious of is of course the fact that um, many civic organizations, including churches are all island bodies um, and uh, how that is quite, obviously that's well established um, and it demonstrates a form of civic, civic togetherness, if you like, and sort of a non-political unity as JC Beckett put it, um, that is really, um, is, is remarkable in some ways and unremarkable in others. Um, and that gives many opportunities, of course, for um, demonstrating, you know, living out the multicultural um, uh, um, 
sort of uh, yeah, demonstrating that the, the sort of insignificance of borders, if you like, for um, for the church. At the same time, of course, what we have seen too is the way in which churches have to navigate the significance of borders as well. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been seen most particularly in relation to COVID. You know, one thing that struck me was the fact when uh, the, the Catholic Church and the Church of Ireland issued statements um, around the what was happening in lockdown. They were advising people to follow the um, basically the, the regulations set out by the authorities, which, as we know, were timed differently and, were, and have been different at different moments throughout this um, pandemic. Um, and so all of the times it's sort of managing the, you know, recognizing the legal and constitutional settings um, at the same time as demonstrating this togetherness as much as possible. Uh, one, uh, you'll remember maybe um, when he was Bishop of Cloha before he became Archbishop of Armagh, John McDowell wrote a letter to Boris Johnson in July 19, a sort of a letter from a border bishop, and it was in relation to Brexit. But um, I liked the part where he said, you know, being part of, you know, being bishop of the of Clover across border diocese, it means he has a vocation to care for people on both sides of the border, but also to pray for the heads of state, you know, for, for, for the British head of state, the Irish head of state, um, and to pray for them and the people who, who um, uh, govern the, the countries. So I thought that was quite a good demonstration of that sort of does it have to be attention or is it a richness, you know? Um, and I was struck by the, the same of the gin read out there because of course, we've, we're all very conscious of the roles that churches or at least sort of um, nominally have, have played in um, emphasizing division and difference, um, including as it relates to, to statehood. And the church leaders statement um, there on St. Patrick's Day, um, in which they refer to the churches being captive to the idols of state and nation, I thought was a very powerful statement, particularly coming in this year. And I'll share the link to it in, in the chat. Um, and You know, oftentimes, you know, oftentimes people speak into very content, you know, into contentious matters as relate to borders and other things, um, influenced by their uh, religious views, etc. And I think it's probably worth just sort of emphasizing that, you know, even in questions relating to broad matters as, like Brexit, like unification, um, there's no, there's nothing that's politically um, unambiguous or even ethically unambiguous. I think it's it's important to recognize that people have very different perceptions of these things for good reason. One thing that we can bring forward though, or that can be bring, brought forward, including by churches, is the importance of truth and um, transparency and the need for spaces to demonstrate you know, connections and commonality as well as differences of opinion, as you said at the very beginning, Podrick, you know. Um, and just, just to conclude the sort of um, this, we're at a new moment now, and um, Jim already mentioned it around sort of the shared island unit and the discussions around that. And again, in that church uh, leader's statement, they were talking about creating spaces for debate and discussion. And I think that's a really, very timely, quite a courageous thing to do at this particular moment when um, things do feel fraud and, and the, what comes next is on everybody's mind, you know, not just about Brexit or unification, of course, but also around post-COVID. We're moving into a very uncertain period in which lots of things are, are unknown. And um, I think that that deliberate intention to create space for dialogue, as you you demonstrate yourself so well, is a has a particular contribution at this moment. Yeah, 
for both of you, Katie and Jin, what are the ways within which kind of international cooperation around areas where there's been borders, you know, whether that's Korea, whether that's Ireland, Cyprus, Germany, what, what is the benefit? Or as you mentioned at the start, Katie, um, the north and the south borders from the United States to Canada and to Mexico, what is the benefit of, of being in collaboration with um, sociologists and other academics and actors on the on the ground there is there a is there a learning are there kind of communities of border experts all around the world who who share information with each other <laughs> i'm curious little societies of you all so one thing that's sort of interesting to reflect back on is just quite how much we you know we we sort of took for granted. So one thing that strikes me, and I, I was sort of bewildered by it at the time, but it, increasingly in retrospect, is you know in the sort of around 2015, um, border studies experts, at least in Europe, were talking about you know sort of borderless Europe, et cetera, et cetera, even as processes of bordering, as we call it. Um, were very apparent, like literally they were building fences between EU member states. And yet it took border studies a long time to kind of get around to recognizing that. So it's quite easy for um, academics who are trying to look at things on the basis of evidence, et cetera, to have their heads completely buried in the sand, uh, not least because it just doesn't, what's happening in reality doesn't fit the, the model or, the, or on, uh, what we've taken, what we've assumed to be the case. Um, but more positively, I mean, it has been very uh, useful to take lessons and, and learn from other other cases. Um, and uh, oftentimes you're learning from mistakes as well as from things that have worked. Um, and as I say, it was extraordinary to be in these these border towns in the US, walking around with you know border officers and agents and customs officials. Um, et cetera, et cetera, and just realizing, um, you know, learning from them about how not to do things or how easily you can end up in a situation where borders are very hard. Um, it might have started out for the, with good intention, but my goodness me, harm can come from it. So that, that's that been very useful to then bring something concrete back into um, a situation of apparent flux as through that, that uh, you know, that... Um, expert panel I was on for the British government in 2019, you know, that was useful to be able to say, well, this is what happens here in US Canada and it doesn't work for whatever reason. So that's kind of, that was really beneficial, I think, in its own way. Jin, there's another question that's come in that I think is quite relevant to you and that could perhaps be slightly linked to what was what Katie was just talking about, which is to say, um, what preparation work do you think can be done theologically perhaps um, whether in Ireland or in Korea, that whatever the outcomes of questions to do with border poles reunifications, that whatever the outcomes of those, that there can be the circumstances for peace and collaboration, and I suppose a, a deep civic ecumenism. What can be done in order to deepen the practice of that, whatever the outcomes of any referenda about unifications in any places where there might be such a thing? What do you think the need is to address that? And have you ever seen it done well that people are addressing differences and not saying this will all be solved just by reunification, but rather saying whatever the question of reunification, this is what we need to work on. And um, thank you very much uh, for the questions and also um, the your question. Um, for years, for, for Korean, unification or reunification issues took an interest uh, in Germany. I, I, I saw one of the questions were related to the German unification experience. Um, but then after the unif unification of Germany, um, people would feel that one or one of the parties from, from the border uh, suddenly just disappeared. It was merged into the other political entity. So it's hugely upsetting for North Korea to have that par you know, parable <laughs> applying to the Korean situation. So they really don't like the German analogy. Yeah. I mean, and because, and then the other thing is that the, the German unification experience is that I saw that they were, it were contentious and confronting border. 
uh, issues, but they never fought against each other in an actual war. So they need, didn't need a peace treaty. On the other hand, the Korean situation requires a peace treaty or peace agreement, and then we, we at least we need to end the war. It really shows that every situation is different, and then the, there's a you know, I mean again that as I mentioned that the situation in Ireland about the unification issue is completely different from the issue in Korea. But at the same time, I, I love what Katie said that you know despite the differences, we can be inspired from what other people are doing. And then for years, the UN, I mean, the UN initiation of the peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding have been really um, sort of tapping on the sort of experience of the Western sort of European experience of what we call liberal peacebuilding. So democracy, human rights, free market economy will fix everything. But then despite the power sharing deals or consociationalism, what is the national referendum? What is the election when there is so 51%, 49%? So we see Brexit and in this, you know, referendum issues coming in, then would 51% winning the election be okay for the 49% of the people? Would this system is really viable solution for many different part of the world where you see the complexity and issues. And then increasingly, I think that there is, in, instead of this international sort of cooperation and solution, you know, imposed upon the other in the name of the international community, perhaps translocal, local to local exchange, cooperation would be, you know, the way in which to promote reciprocal empowerment. That's what I would want to promote which is the term mostly used in the feminist sort of uh, women's empowerment uh, literatures to highlight the fact that in terms of the intersectionalities of the women's rights issues, and, and then perhaps the women could really talk to each other in a transversal way to learn about each other's situation, uh, but then at the same time, having a personal authority about their issue. And then in that case, you know, I am more, I mean, in this settings that I can perhaps freely say uh, about Korea because I'm, I'm, I'm the Korean in the group. <laughs> but then in Korea, it's a very contentious issues. And then if I am vocal about, for example, in inclination of one issues and the other, and it's a very dangerous thing for me to do. But then I can talk about the Irish case in the Korean context. And then that's a safe way for us to realize, again, going back to my first sort of encounter with the context, my Zitzin Laban moment, my, my yearning for prophetic imagination about the, what it means to be living as a citizen in the reign of God. And then and before, before that as, as a Korean citizen in, in the Korean peninsula and what did that mean? And I, ironically, I find that answer every day in Ireland. So, so I think that that's, that's, that would be doable and viable if we, as the people who are being, you know, you know, suffered because of the nature of the borders and to have a translocal alliance and cooperation to understand what it means to be living in this situation and to help with each other and having a solidarity. And then I, I think that, that there is a movement and then we, we, as academics, we need to look at the situation and then how to understand and conceptualize and theorize those movements. For, I mean, that would be the academic job, but I, as a practitioner and a theologian and then Christians, I think that we could be in alliance with local churches and various people in the world with the different religions and cultures to be able to do that. Thanks. And we're coming really close to finishing up and we'll have um, a link to a feedback form that we'll send out. And I think somebody's already put in the link from the statement issued by the four church leaders on the island of Ireland um, on St. Patrick's Day the other day too. But I'd, I'd really love to hear briefly from Katie and Jin, like what is it that you think is of importance to turn um, attention to at the moment when it comes to the question, particularly um, in Ireland, north and south of the border? Would you say that there's something that is worthwhile turning hope to or something to say um, 
read this book or something that you'd say, this is going to be important. I don't want to ask you to tell us something hopeful, although that would be lovely, because maybe you don't have something hopeful to say, you might have something somber to say, which is to say, take this course or read this article. What would you leave us with as something to say, this is going to be helpful for you? You're both being uh, <laughs> aging. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 I'll just say a couple of things. So one is um, one interesting thing that's been happening for a while in relation to borders, um, and that is going to be important for the island of Ireland, but particularly in the north, is the role of, and it sounds very ominous, but like citizens as border guards. So increasingly, the way in which we are asked to um, uh, differentiate between individuals and between citizens. So, um, you know, do people have a right to work, et cetera? And that's then going to grow because that's going to be now with our EU, you know, friends. Um, and this is something that will, will have an impact, I think, in the longer term. But more broadly, I mean, obviously, there's so much talk around borders at the moment. And as, um, you know, the sea border is a thing. Um, and one way of conceptualizing it you know, and it sounds rather crass, but it is to think not as borders as sort of lines of division or state authority, but as meeting points. Um, and um, sort of also, as you say, it's, it's the point of the limitation of sovereignty even, you know, so um, w where sovereignty comes to an end um, and where new things open up and, um, we will just get more and more, we'll hear more and more about the Irish Sea border, et cetera, et cetera. As I say, this is, feels like a moment of flux, but in all these times, it is possibly worth thinking in those terms about borders as, as um, lines of connection, if you like. That's very helpful. Thanks, Katie. And Jim, what would you um, briefly point us towards that might be something that you think is worthwhile paying attention to? Um, just briefly before my first comments that, you know, what Katie's, uh, told us about the sea border is really quite striking because Korean Maritime Institute <laughs> visited a couple of years ago just really to look at and examine the, the exact you know issues that Katie was talking about but then at the moment you know I mean I know that it also the COVID-19 situation has been highlighting the situation here all the more whether it should be the north and the south border that we should really closed down in terms of the quarantines and all the other issues or the East and the West Sea, I mean, sort of the issues, uh, they want to call it, you know, border because that would be really a problematic thing to say. But then in terms of the, I mean, one of the things really I would want to say, maybe it, it would be a bit uh, contentious things to say, but as a Korean, sometimes, but sometimes, you know, in Korea, many people would feel that, you know, this issue is because we are so immersed in this context. And then, so the issue about the Korean conflict and the division, it's really the most important thing in the world. That means, you know, so this, this is, I mean, sometimes it, it blurs our visions and then we can't really see other things, what's happening around the world. But then I think the COVID-19 has been really, sort of, I mean, it's a tragic thing. And then I think, but it's an alarm call for us to look beyond. For example, you know, the, the, the countries who are not, you know, rich enough to get vaccines, not only about the supply, but then, so the international community came up with the idea of COVAX facilities to address that issues. But COVAX facilities, they only can cover 20% of the national sort of uh, capacity that means that still 80 percent of the people in that you know global south including north korea i mean would not be able to achieve the herd so-called herd immunity and then yeah. what would be the new meaning of the border in this situation and then this is anyway we, we didn't start this but then it's it's beginning i mean anyway and then the, it's a globalized world so how could we that we address this issue? I think it, it's really going to be the completely different world. And then the either whether it's an Irish question or Northern Irish question or Korean questions, 
I, I think that without addressing the issues of, of those vulnerable populations, you know, who can't really afford to have the vaccine, I mean, our, perhaps our discussion about border would not be really meaningful because of the new world and situation, I think. Uh, from both of you are really um, somber um, invitations to pay attention and to also pay attention that the, the imagination about what border is and how that might be solved in some imaginations by fortifying or by changing, that actually that, that ground is changing force and that there's, there, there's other questions to pay attention to too. Both of you have offered so much of your scholarship and your insight and um, with each question you've gone beneath the question really and shaken it a little bit which which is the real hope that we could have is that <clears throat> excuse me that folks who are here and listening and contributing questions for which thank you that folks could um have questions reframed and be given new ways to pose questions as well as new ways to listen um katie hayward and um jin dong kim thank you so very much to both of you for uh, all the work you do, as well as the great generosity that you've given um, during this time. I'm sure people will be giving um, gratitude to both of you. And I know that lots of people have been doing that in the chat already. Um, I'll be sending out an email tomorrow that will have um, some links. Um, if you want to follow along um, Katie and Jin's work, um, follow along some of their um, online social media or some of their current or upcoming publications, as well as publications of other people that have been part of the six weeks of Theology and Conversation. I know that Sarah has just dropped in the link to feedback. I'll also send that out to you tomorrow. Um, it should take you about three minutes. And it isn't just, were we lovely, very lovely, or very, very lovely? It's saying, is what did you remember? What did you learn? Just give us one sentence about that, because we're really keen to learn from your learning. And as well as saying, how can we make digital hospitality work? We're all learning in this. And uh, Cara Mila has such a way within which we know how to work with a room of people present in the room. We're trying to learn about what that might look in a Cara Mila digital space. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, Sarah Williamson and Emily Rawling and Carrie Gibson and colleagues at Cara Mila, as well as previous speakers. And of course, um, all of our audience um, who've been coming um, to these over the last six weeks. It's been a lovely way to journey through Lent with each other, asking the question about how theology can be in conversation with issues in the wider world, and how is it that we can ask questions in new ways that can open up the heart, open up the mind, and open up possibilities for new ways of thinking towards each other too. So um, uh, that is it. That's the end of our um, six weeks of Theology and Conversation. There's so many faces that I see from people who've been at every one. Thank you so much for your time. It's wonderful to see you, to see your questions come in. And um, we're delighted to have shared the space with you. And just again, to finish off for tonight, to Katie and to Jin, thank you so much for your work and for the generosity of your, um, your time here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh,